Oh, hi, everyone. We're live. And uh, in true rock star fashion, we started a little, little late. Dickie Barrett's going to be here pretty soon. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to do the show alone because that's what I do when I'm the only one here. I continue to speak by myself as one does. And today I'm going to talk about collective consciousness. So I, my guest today is Dickie Barrett, who you may know. He was actually on Timcast IRL a couple of few weeks ago with his band, The Defiant, and they played a set at the end of the show, which was absolutely rock star. Super good, especially It's Over. It is over, the name of the song, the last song on the album, which I highly recommend picking up at thedefiantmusic.com. Let me double check that website. The, the, yeah, oh, it's the defiantofficial.com. Great stuff. And uh, me and Dickie hit it off on the show. He's a funny guy. I was a huge fan of the Boss Tones growing up. Uh, really, it was probably... 1995 when this girl it was like my third girlfriend you know i was like this dorky high school kid but i started doing theater and uh started to meet girls in the theater i never had like real i, I always thought because i had two brothers I, my mom was pretty cool but she was kind of hardcore so i was wasn't very socialized for women and then but my, my third girlfriend got me a mixtape with one of dickie's songs on him and now he's here hello sir oh you're still muted you might have to, yeah you might have to change your audio settings and uh down in the settings and then flip it to your mic so that's your camera mic uh, i'm still i'll let you know when i get audio i'll just assume that you don't have it until i say yes there you are but you can listen to me in the meantime uh while you're getting it set up and oh nice christmas tree by the way no nothing yet no but you're getting there it's it's coming i i see your lips moving but i don't hear a thing nope but you can hear me because I'm a good storyteller. Hi. You'll get it in the... <laughs> Look into my eyes, Dickie. Look into my eyes. Uh, it's in the settings at the bottom. Dickie's coming from his phone, so there might be uh, might be a little bit of a different... No, nothing there yet. Negative, good sir. Let's see here. Oh, maybe I can edit your mic. No, I'm not going to peace out. Put peace in, brother. Uh... Yeah, you'll go down to the settings and then you'll change your mic options and uh, go to your audio options and then your input mic. That's probably the answer. So while you're getting that set up, I'm going to finish this story about my third girlfriend that got me a mixtape with uh, one of the Boston songs on it, one of the early ones. It was uh, Someday, I Suppose. I didn't know nothing yet. No, I cannot hear. I know. And I sense your frustration as well. I can see it in your forehead and in your eyes. Uh, oh, yeah, I would love to have Greg Camp on. That's Cats and Guitars. That's a great, a great, great concept. Greg Camp's also in The Defiant with Dickie. Can't hear you yet, but it's happening. Uh, I kind of want to call Dickie and just say, hey, what's up? So my the girl got me the mixtape. Someday, I suppose, was on it. I was like, who the hell is this? This is a great song, especially the chorus. And I, I listened to it like, 50 times it was right when i was learning how to drive and that was a big deal you know i was like becoming a man and so i always associated that song with like becoming a man kind of and that was wild when his camera flipped sideways and uh ever since i was really appreciative of the mighty mighty bosses no nothing yet it's probably oh you're muted you're muted so that's a big part of it let's see let's see if i can unmute the fellow can't unmute your guest their mic isn't connected it says your mic's not connected. That's probably why. Um, and then I'll just keep telling the story while you'll get it. You'll get it. Yeah, it's it's yeah, you're you're gonna get it. You're a master of words, dude. The power is flowing through you and the understanding is natural. I think what you should maybe do is leave and come back. And then it'll probably recalibrate your phone. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, that that kind of shows me that Dickie could hear me, which is a good sign. Then in college, I got into the Mighty Mighty Boston's when Let's Face It came out. That's the the white album with uh, it's just all white and in the corner. It's like all the dudes looking up at the at the sky, and that had like uh, uh, you know, the Rascal King was on it. Um. So, uh, the impression that I get never had to knock on wood, but I know sometimes I had, you know, that song because I'm sure it isn't good. 
I always wonder why I wasn't called knock. Hold on. Hey, there you are. Oh, my Lord. I'm so sorry. I'm ruining your show. My show's great. <laughs> I know best. your show's great, but not with me on it. It was spectacular. You could see it was all like you're see you're a musician. So being able to, to read your like hear you through <laughs> your facial expressions was kind of interesting. I'm a front man. I was doing all my front man stuff. Dude, so I, why did I love you, Ian? <laughs> I love you too, Dickie. <laughs> um, what so why the impression that I get, why was it not called knock on wood? Is it because that disco song, knock on wood? <laughs> on wood. Yeah. Uh, I think that when I wrote the lyrics, I think that it 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 ended up kind of uh that knock on wood, it just kind of where it musically landed, kind of made it should have been maybe knock on wood and it kind of confused people because the, the thing the uh, whole phrase ends with that's the impression that I get and it's kind of less than the knock on wood but um I had written it and called it impression that I get long before I recorded it so once I recorded it it became uh obvious that it should be a knock on wood, but I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I just kind of leaned into it. And the funny thing about that is we never even imagined it was the, you know, juggernaut it was, or the, it, that it would take off like that. So we kind of put it on a compilation album before we released it on the, on the let's face it album. And then it, it just skyrocketed. I, I won over uh, two questions. I watched the music video for it after you guys left uh, a couple weeks ago. I was like, got back. Oh, in yeah, and kind of, yeah. And it was like, <laughs> I watched you guys playing and I, I kind of, I've been there recording music videos and I imagined like that it must've been in that moment that you guys were realizing, like we just did something hu bigger than we've ever anticipated. And like, this is going to take us to realms uncharted. And at the very end of the video, I see you go over and hug the guitarist and like, give him like a, and then he like, his his like he takes his glasses off and it looks like he transitions from a kid into a man in that moment oh that's such a cool observation now i'm gonna go watch the video for the first time in 20 years it is was that what was it like was that the one was that like i think that we just kind of ended and then they're still filming us and we're on that white background and we're standing around and i think um you know i think we maybe it was the end of the day and we were happy it was over. So we started hugging each other. Yeah. I can't remember exactly why we did that. And then, uh, but you know, we were in the eye of the storm as we're filming because it's all of a sudden like, you know, you're just doing so much stuff and, and you're getting calls all the time and like, all right, you're, you got to go to the MTV beach house this week. Are you going to, you know, Saturday Night Live is considering you and, and all of that. So, and we're just, we were just a band in a van, Ian. I mean, just rolling around in our own kind of sort of world and our own sort of safe space, just us, you know, it was usually like 10 to 12 guys piled in that van. And then there was at least nine guys piled on the stage every night. So, I mean, it was strange and weird. And, I, and I've said this before. I think if I had it to do over again, I would have enjoyed it more than I enjoyed it. What was it about it that you weren't enjoying at the time? Uh, it felt like to me because we were a punk rock band and we had built it on, you know, just getting out there. And we had these, you know, loyal fans. And it felt, you know, the, the and at that time, the way things were, you, you might not even be young enough to remember, but it was the dreaded sellout. You know, you didn't want to get slammed with that at that time. And, and you know, songs being in movies like Clueless and, and which we had to do because we had, um, we had financial problems. We had tax problems. A tax man was after us and we had a manager that didn't pay taxes. So they offered us that movie and we we're like, ah, I don't want to do this movie about uh, the the movie was clueless about um, Beverly Hill kid, Hills kids, and then on the flip side, we've got to get out of this financial jam. So, so all of that was kind of coming down on me, and I, and it just I, you know, just felt like oh, you know, the fan base we built, and the, the people that love the Boston's, the people that really know the Boston's, and the people that bought the first album, and. Then the second album, or you know, gonna go. That's it. 
these guys are sellouts. And and all we were doing when we were writing the music, and am, am I babbling? No, this is fucking great, man. This is exactly <laughs> what I love. I'm trying to make up for the time I fumbled and tried all to, right. <laughs> you know, technologically, I'm still a, 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 a nitwit. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it was like, I was just so, pre I was so protective of those, that fan base and those fans and those people that were with us from the very beginning. And that I knew would show up at the shows after we were on in a movie or after we were at, but I didn't, you know, it was, like I said, it was, it was valuable to me and I didn't, I didn't want to betray them and, and go, okay, now we belong to the world. We no longer belong to just you. And, and so I kind of, you know, stumbled through that, like sort of, kind of glossy eyed and going, uh, and your place is where you don't feel like you really should be like, you know, um, whether it's, you know, late night television or, um, you know, the, the, the anything that MTV would throw at you, that the label would come at us and go, okay, you know, now you're going to be on the Jenny McCarthy show and they're like, ah, you know, okay. You know, and, and you don't want to, it was a lot. And, and it was, it was both a dream come true and sort of a nightmare at the same time. So. Yeah. Nightmares are definitely dreams. And well, you remember, you remember like, you know, it was when the before, just before the Boston's broke and bands like Green Day broke and bands like, you know, No Doubt broke the musical temperature, the climate at that time was, was grunge. And, and it was, you know, kind of Kurt Cobain sort of, you know, wrote the rules and you don't sell out and you don't do this and you, you know, you, you don't be agreeable. And, um, and so things were changing and, but I was part of sort of the old guard and, uh, you know, so that what went on. So, th so I answered your question with a real long jag and I, I Hopefully hope we'll do that. Good. Yeah, yeah. I hope we'll do that like five more times. That, that's my plan. <laughs> uh, when you I'm were you making stays on. It sounds great. Yeah. Did, did you were you making all the decisions for the band in the beginning? Is that how it worked? Um, no, it was collective. We made the decisions together. You know, if you're talking about the suits, yeah, that was my idea. Oh. And a couple of the guys would have preferred not to have worn suits, but in but in the long run, in the end of the day, everyone was uh happy we looked the way we looked you know it was it was we were trying to um we were trying to assault all of all five of your senses so we'd wear suits that were that were in this pattern and we would um you know yell loudly into our microphones and we'd you know bang away at it so i don't know what you we did for smell but for smell yeah you had to be there i guess <laughs> and you, it's challenging to smell okay. yourself you know Oh, okay, good. I was the only one we didn't offend. I think our, our scent was fine. Who you said there were twelve dudes, but only you only ever had nine on stage, or was it just like guys would cycle in? No, we had we had twelve guys because we had a crew. You know, we had somebody tour managing, and tour managing back then, dude, was that was super interesting too. Or or even touring, like there was no you know map quest, or there was you know you, there was no cell phones. We at one point we got a cell phone that was this big a piece of equipment it was almost the size of like joe's base head you know and it was it was a suitcase and it was for emergencies because i don't i don't know how it worked but it was like if you make a call on that then it's 300 dollars, and it, and it looked like a regular like one of these phones like think of your mother's kitchen and um and it was in a suitcase and I, I don't can't remember ever using i think we used it once where we broke down so no cell phones no map quest no uh navigational no you know you, you had a, a atlas do you remember those yeah yeah like a big map you'd pull out of the glove box <laughs> a big map and you would really be like i know take somebody would be like take a left Looks like we take a right up ahead and the, and the clubs would send you directions and it'd be just that. Okay, when you get into town, look for a sit-go station and then go about a mile. If you go farther than that, it was crazy times.
Did you have the old same Dan dude? Barrett tells you about the old days. Yeah, I love it. This is my, it's <laughs> I kind of am in the middle. Like I was born in '79, so I was still young. But oh, I, you're I, a pop. Yeah, we went on vacations, and we, my my dad would have the map in the passenger yeah. seat. Like I I think we gotta go further <laughs> north, and then we'll. Honey, yeah. pull over and ask somebody. Just pull over and yes. ask somebody. It was Why a humbling... won't you pull over? Did you guys <laughs> have like a driver or was it the tour manager would drive? Uh, the, Joe Gittleman, the bass player, did most of the driving that I remember. Once in a while, someone else. I was, I was out of those, all those guys, 12 guys that were in the van, um, I was last to drive. There was, you know, if somebody woke up and saw me driving, they was like, oh, what happened? Is everybody else dead? Just to keep, so you could keep your head straight and like. No, because I was a horrible driver, and you know, no, no one trusted me doing anything. That's part of the being the wild front man when you're not yeah. playing an instrument is like, like rhythm. I don't know if it's like rhythm's a challenge. I'll go in and out of playing and singing at the same time, and then just putting that on the guitar and singing, and I feel like you can get a lot more off rhythm momentum without that instrument i don't know what yeah. you're experience. probably when but when you find the pocket it's real nice to be in there and i had such a great band and 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 do now too the defiant are the same way we played um over the weekend in uh southern california but um if if you play with the type of people that i play with and they you know they're able to put you in the pocket or they're able to help you get there or or it's the pocket is just so obvious and when you're in it there's nothing like it and and uh and i can't say i'm always there and i can't say that uh you know my skills are are probably limited the things i'm good at and i hope this doesn't sound like bragging is are writing lyrics and just kind of fronting and delivering the message i think i once once i hit the stage i'm I'm great, but I, but uh, I'm flawed in every. Think of everything that you do well, and I think that what you do and how you do it is great, Ian. But um, I'm I'm not I'm not anywhere near there. So mostly, it's just, I have the message and the things that I want to say and the things that I think are important to say, and um, I I have the ability to deliver them without being afraid or or yeah. You know. That's what I was wondering. I want to ask about like I, I I started listening to some of the songs. Now that I'm an adult, like uh, older, I can appreciate writing. Now that I'm a songwriter as well, because when I got into yeah. the Lost Ones, I hadn't begun my music career at all. Like, what was your? Some of those lyrics are profound, man. Like, it's like oh, uh, man. artistic. What's that? I said thank you. Yeah, yeah. What was? <laughs> how'd you get there? What were you doing? Uh, poetry when I was a kid, very young. In junior high i just started putting words together i like i like to draw pictures and and put words together those were the my two main interests when i was just a wee lad but um so and i and i, I had a teacher an english teacher who wasn't really my teacher but he was at the school and he um sought me out he heard that there's a kid that likes to write poetry and he found me and it was a pretty big school but uh and he just encouraged me and said, you know, it's, it was a very sports oriented town and sports oriented school. And although I love sports, I was horrible at it. They, um, so this teacher kind of took me under his wing. He was, he was an inner city guy that came into our suburban town and uh, just encouraged me to write. And, I, and I'm so grateful and so thankful. And, and if I see the guy, which I do every once in a while, he'll, he used to come to Boston shows every now and then. And if I'm in my hometown, I'll go by, swing by his house and say hello. But I'm super grateful. This is one of those kind of cliche and corny stories of a, you know, teacher who finds a troubled kid and sends them in the right direction. Would he like take you after class and be like, show me what you got, kid? Yeah, me and my uh, we used to shoot baskets with him. He was the basketball teacher, but I wasn't. I wasn't a basketball player, but I would go shoot baskets with him. And uh, he'd just, you know, he'd he'd give me notebooks and say, "Fill these notebooks." And and uh, for years later, now and I'm I'm an old guy, but he would uh, kids from my hometown would go, uh, "Oh, Mr. Powell taught your um, 
there's part of his poetry, part of his curricu curricula, curriculum was um, the poems of Dickie Barrett. So it'd be a whole section of his of his year that he would teach his class my poetry and be like, you know, then I'd run into people at kids at shows and they'd go, Mr. Powell read you, did you read your poems to us? And I was like, oh, that's cool. Do you still have them? Uh, he still has them, and I, I still have them probably somewhere. Did you ever end up using any of that stuff in songs later? I think one or two once, but then I rewrote them because, I don't know, because that's what I do. I always rework stuff. I used to write poems, too. That's interesting. That is a like a first step into songwriting. Yeah, oh, for sure. Well, if you're going to, you know, certainly if, on the lyrical end, and then... I was lucky enough to meet people that were very musical and were able yeah. to. What's that? Oh, you yeah. said, I think when we were talking a few weeks ago, you were saying, because I was like, did you get into music as a kid? And you're like, well, if you mean by 18, yeah. But like when you were 12, you didn't know exactly. But then at what point in your adolescence did you think like, I got it. That's it. I got to I got to sing with, I got to do this. Well, I, I just, I loved rock and roll early on and, you know, AM radio, the radio that my parents listened. So I, I loved rock and roll and music. And then me and my brother would buy some Beatles records. And this was, you know, after the Beatles, but we had an interest in that. And then it was Aerosmith. And then, you know, we just started collecting records and we liked the rock and roll. Then when punk came along, it was forget about it. You know, I was like, oh, I can, there's a possibility I could be involved in this. So I just kind of, it was a dream. I wanted to be in a band. I set my sights on it. And, and uh, at that time too, there were lots of bands and everybody was had a band and, um, and there was lots of live music. So by the time I hit 18, I was living in Boston and part of the Boston, you know, rock and roll, punk rock music scene. And, you know, I guess the rest would be history. But yeah, I, I, lo I love music. and I just put together Boston is Boston. <laughs> is that right? That, it's got to be. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. I was going to call us Boston, but that had been taken. Yeah. Were you a big fan of Boston? Uh, I was pretty impressed by him. And the record was huge in our town. When that first Boston record came out, I liked, probably liked, I liked Jay Giles' band better and Aerosmith better and... Um, but I liked Boston, dude. Jay Giles band <laughs> rocked my core. I mean, uh, that the, was, to me, was they that was the first band that I just absolutely loved. Jay Giles band, and in Boston because that's where they were from. And other people go, dude, they were from Worcester, Massachusetts. But uh, I think Jay Giles himself was from Worcester, but the band was a Boston band. Yeah, and I had a, they they have freeze frame, which was great. The uh, <coughs> the biggest hit, I, I just had it in my head. What's the name of their biggest hit? Centerfold. Centerfold is so good. I mean, that yeah. song I used to listen to it as a kid on tape. I got it on tape, and I would be able to listen to it over and over again. It's so cool, Ian, that you like Jay Giles. I love people who like Jay Giles, but that but I liked them before the hits. So <clears throat> in my town, and when I was a kid they put out this live album called blow your face out check it out you know jot this stuff down check out blow your face out it's a live album and it has songs on it like give it to me and south side shuffle and um but the, but uh and and it was before the hits i mean they when mtv came around they had freeze frame centerfold and all that but before that there was you know other songs other um stuff that like the and they were huge in two places at that time they were huge in detroit and they were huge in boston because that's where they were from how's that happen that you get huge in like just a i mean it's before touring. the internet oh. it's touring it just ends up being how you know if so if you're a road band which they were you you know it's where um you just kind of connect you know live did you guys have specific cities where you were landing where you're just this is it we did better in some places than others and also not just touring but it's also radio local radio so um 
you know, it's not, there was no internet. So it's, you know, a DJ in Detroit picks up, you know, Southside Shuffle and starts playing it. So then, you know, there, there were bands at the time that like were huge in Los Angeles that we never heard of, you okay. know, back, because maybe K-Rock picked them up and started playing them. And that would happen. Now it's everybody knows everything and we share all share the same thing. Yeah, what's the biggest, like back in the day, it was like there were gatekeepers. You listen to Rock 107.9 or, or like Power 108 in Cleveland. I would listen to it all the time, 96.5 FM. And the, the gatekeepers would be like, this is the song you're going to hear now. This is <laughs> yeah. REM. This is right. and uh, Hootie and the Blowfish. And like now, what's the difference from your perspective, having gone through the going through the gatekeepers to now it's like the gates are all open from every angle. There's no walls. It's it's pretty great. And I, and I gotta be honest, the stuff that like Tim's doing with them um, and, and yourself and everybody there is doing with the, you know, trying to win the cultural wars is, is awesome. I love that. That's so, so impressive to me and just so fun where there's no gatekeepers, you know, where it's, where, where you know, if we're not limited by, the the industry says this, or the the you know you look the radio stations say this. These are the songs you're going to listen to. These are the songs you hear, and all bets are off. So that's a lot of fun. But I can't say at the time I I was thinking too much about it. You know, there were places where I was going. Gosh, I wish they'd play our music. And then there was other play. You know, other things that I you didn't really think about. You kind of just had your your shows to play and places to go did you were you politically active as a youth like in the early days of rock were you guys in the culture war so to speak with your music did you feel like you were participating in shifting culture and stuff i felt i felt like i yes i felt like we were i felt like we had things to say and and they were important and um whether I was right about that or wrong about that, I'm not sure. But there's things we believed in as a, as a collective, and and stuff we stood behind, and we, we were very committed to to our beliefs and our thoughts and our and the message we were trying to deliver. What was it? Uh, it was mostly unity, you know, strength from unity, and it's not much different than my message now and and the power of love you know much like yourself um and that was it you know and how how do we get there and and you know who who are our allies and who who you know who are our enemies and and a lot of times it's not who you think that dude there's something impressive about what you do in that you you're able to work with like 11 other eight other musicians or nine other musicians and like keep it cohesive, keep it together for 30 years or four, however long that the Boston's were now with the define it's five guys. And like, it's so tight. It gets there. They seem to like each other so much. And like, I've seen bands and I've actually been in bands where I became as the lead singer, the disruptive force. And was like, it's, if, if you're not going to let me say what I want to say, then I'm not going to say it kind of mentality and like overly critical. And, and so to, to, to be able to corral, like talking about unity, to be able to have a band of nine people. Uh, yeah. Well, it had to do with, with you know, it was, we're, it was a good thing and it was a fun thing and it, we made it enjoyable and we, you know, we weren't, we, you know, I don't think we were stupid people and we, I don't think we were narcissists and we knew that, you know, minus this guy, it's going to be less than and not, not greater than. So, you know, I think a lot of uh, times people let egos or, or people just aren't smart enough to not let egos get in the way. Um, you know, whatever happened, I guess, I guess, you know, whatever happened at the end happened at the end. But at, you know, for so many years, that's how it operated is, you know, we enjoyed doing it. We enjoyed getting together. We enjoyed each other's company. We enjoyed you know, sharing our artwork with other people. And, uh, and, and that's all I've ever really been any good at. So, uh, 
I was glad to have that opportunity. Was it like a small band in the, the Boston's? Were they small in the beginning? I, I didn't really follow the early days, but did it like grow over time? Uh, you mean it as personnel or do you mean? Uh, yeah, personnel. Followers. Like how many guys on stage? Jam? Was it just you and the bassist in the beginning? And <laughs> No, in the beginning, it was probably the bassist and the guitar player. There's Nate and uh, Joe. And they um, they were playing together. They were kids in Cambridge, and and I was friends with uh, with Nate's older brother. And Joe was somehow high school roadie for a lot of you know punk bands in Boston. And he ended up being a roadie for my brother's band. And he was really kind of even too young to be in the clubs, but he was the guy that was lugging in the gear and setting up the guitars and. Um, you know, typical roadie stuff. And we became real, real close friends. And I had, I was in a different band. I was in a, first I was in a hardcore band called Impact Unit. And then I was in a band called the Cheapskates, which was sort of like the Boston's. And it was a bunch of different Boston hardcore kids that came up with the ska band. And, um, and that was short lived. And then uh, Joe and Nate said, "Hey, well, we, you know, we're we've got a band, and would you like to be part of that?" And at first, I was like, "Ah, eh, I'm not so sure." And then I came by to see them practice and enjoyed being around the guys. And so from there, we got a we got a drummer, came up with some horn players, and uh, before we took it on the road or or did anything, we went into the studio. The band was at least eight members by then. With the horns, did that come? Is like an afterthought or was that everybody in the beginning was like yo this is horns well, we were going to be a ska band so we knew we had to have horns you know you, and, you and i liked big bands i like the jay giles band was a big band oh, i've never seen them live i gotta watch some of their live stuff check them out oh uh, uh, dude oh, what's that nothing oh nate but, on the on the bass the early nate that's uh nate the guitar the joe yeah. dude that guy that guy is a genius. He like those bass lines. He's really, really good. Dude. Yeah. I I don't I didn't understand how to appreciate that melody coming out of a bait like that. It's all not erratic. It, somebody that's not paying attention might think it's erratic, but then you listen to it and it's just majestic. Like it's like he'll get 15 notes in like a bar or like two bars. But it doesn't sound overdone either. I think it's not like, you know, I know I, I we never like kind of went for what like flea was doing or anything but it was it, it, it sort of kind of designed off of of um i think he was inspired whether he knew it or not by bands like you know uh, joe jackson or or um you know the the new wave bands kind of had real nice bass lines running through it and not just you know nothing simple it, it held the jam was probably a, a good example of what was going on bass wise a band called the jam i'm not familiar with them the jam yeah that's paul weller and uh they were an english punk english mod band they were like think the who or early who or uh except they were part of that whole um 1977 brit thing that was going on at that time yeah it's kind of like joe was playing the lead and then nate was on the on the sixth string was like the rhythm I mean, and they, maybe they go in and out. I, I'm not super familiar with all the stuff, but like the bass is like, it's just so, I don't know. I guess it's the simplest thing to say is it's playing a lead. It's super perceptive of you, Ian. You're, you're not wrong at all. And, and I'm in the same way. I don't know. I can't say exactly how to put it into words, but yes, there's definitely, the, that was definitely the backbone. And, and you know, things were hung on, on what Joe was doing bass-wise. Oh yeah. And then he locked in with the, the drummer where they, did they get really yeah. tight? They seem to be pretty tight. Yes. Now early on, we had a different drummer. His name was Josh Dalsimer and he played till he got out of high school. And then um, he went on to school and stuff. And then we, I, I met a guy who was going to a community college and there was a kid and that was always, you know, he knew that I was in the Boston's everything. It kind of, you know, anytime I was around him, he'd mention, um, yeah, I played the drums, I played the drums, you know, and, a bit. and then when Josh left the band, we were like, oh, we got to get a drummer. And I go, well, there's this kid that's, you know, always smoking cigarettes with me. And uh, 
hanging out in the smoking area of the college. And um, he says he plays the drums. Let's give him a try. And his name is Joseph Royce. And then, he, and he was a kid. He was five or six years younger than us. And uh, he, he was phenomenal. He'd, and he'd been the drummer for the Boston's at, since, you know. So, and Joe and and Joe, Joe and Joe, bass and drums, they they were tight. They became super locked in and created that pocket I was talking about earlier. Were they still this? I mean, I know Joe's still in the band in nineteen. Ian, yeah, you hear me? Oh man, what, what happened? Tell me about oh, it. You, you drifted off on me. You got you got it now. Can you hear me again? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You're oh, good. Yeah, from my angle, nothing's changed. All right. Um, they uh, I think was it tw night uh twenty nineteen when you guys I watched some live stuff. Is it the same drummer? Is it Joe and Joe still? Yes. Yeah, those yeah. guys are so good. They're so tight. That was really yeah. impressive. That's you, Joe and Joe. So you were smoking, you said, in the early, like a cigarette smoker. Did that, I mean, obviously it's affected your voice. You've got a gray, you got the gray. <laughs> Did you, at, at any point, like... I was part of it. I was almost reluctant to give them up. I didn't want to screw up my voice. Oh. But my whole family sounds like this, Ian. Oh, did this non-smokers... My, sister, my sisters, my mother... Everyone, wretched. But like, do they? But they smoke or they don't smoke. My mother smoked. And I think she started again too, and she's very old. Um, I smoked till I was thirty. Um, my sister didn't smoke that I remember. Would you smoke on stage? Oh yeah, I thought that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like intentionally like get your voice really dry and grainy before performance? Yeah, I think there was like songs that mentioned cigarettes, and I would go for one then. Um, like did so? What was your recovery to like? I mean, you didn't you didn't like go? Ah! I didn't hear you like going up and doing the screaming super high no. shit. But like, no, I couldn't do that. It was all low, kind of. You know, the original singing or the original performing I started doing was in a hardcore band. And, and East Coast hardcore bands were very like, it was, you know, melody was secondary and, you know, screaming into the mic was first. Uh, what was your recovery of your vocal recovery tactics? Oh, man. Uh, I, when we were touring heavily, like mid nineties and it was, you know, 300 and something shows a year. Um, I could do five shows, but then I needed a day off. I needed one day off and it was always sort of, hey, brody, you know, so it was, if, if you think my voice is speaking voice is rough now in my touring, heavy, heavy touring years, it was, um, people would go, dude, don't talk all right just don't <laughs> and i'd be no it doesn't hurt and people be like it sounds painful as hell <laughs> well, well, on the days that you take off what would you do anything special uh you know i'd want to go around and you know see whatever city we were in but it was best if i just sat drank water had tea spent the day in the hotel chills just like that just like herbal, like an like a non caffeinated tea with yeah, juice. this something that I that we were always rolling with called throat coat tea. Yeah, I know throat coat. You familiar with that yeah, guy? They got, they got some good stuff. Yeah, like uh, echinacea sometimes. Ooh, that's good. I was yeah, I drank bottles of echinacea. Yeah, for sure. Oh, uh, did you do lemon and honey? Ozzy Osbourne gave me this stuff. It's called um. I don't know if it's called, there's two, two, one of them's called Entertainer's Secret. And the other one, if he showed me the bottle, I'd show you, I'd tell you that's the stuff. And it, and there's the thing about it is one of them has alcohol in it and the one with alcohol in it is bad. So you don't want that. The other one is like a water-based product spray. And, um, I, and it was during heavy touring and I met Ozzy for like four minutes, you know, like there's like, D Dickie, do you want to meet Ozzy? He's here. Oh, look at that old school phone here, a, uh, dude. You got a rotary phone? Might be, might be Ozzy. It's the kids' <laughs> phone. Was, 
I was thinking it was Ozzy. Yeah. Hello, Ozzy. Hold on, Jackie. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm the least professional person in the world. I'm so sorry. I'm just supporting your podcast. The, the Christmas tree is the best part. Did you decorate that? The kids did. That'd well, nice. I, I put it up. Do you oh, like cool. it? Yeah, I like it a lot. That was my idea. Was, at least, I, you know, if I'm fumbling around trying to turn my mic on, at least they can look at my nice tree. Also, the angle, you look like a giant, which is pretty cool. <laughs> that's a huge, that's a 35 foot tree behind me. <laughs> yeah. Did you? <sighs> oh, you were saying, oh, so you met Ozzy for four minutes. Then what happened? Okay. So, and it was during the heavy touring. And like I said, you know, and he heard, my, so nice to meet you, Ozzy. And he's like, oh, your voice. And I go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what it sounds like. And then he said he had somebody bring me some of this spray. And I'd been using that spray for years. And, uh, uh, yeah, forgot. You still it. use it? I, I'm going to now. I've, I've kind of forgot about it. I haven't been touring in a couple of years. Whoa. So I'm going to get a, an, a load or a case. Yeah, let me know. I'll follow up. I want to find out what it is because I – I, the other night I was like, I just need to feel something in my gut. I was just get emotional. And I, I was screaming Pearl jam 10, like the early days, even flow release yeah. and blew my, my, my voice is now in like day two recovery. And I, yes. I tried a little alcohol last night for the first time in a, in a couple months. I haven't had much. Um, and a little bit was good, but a little bit more was not because it started to dry it out. That's what the alcohol will do. Yeah. The alcohol you, and the cigarettes are, are the worst things. Did you do a lot of alcohol in the the touring days, like the early heavy touring days? Yeah. Um, as kids, that's what we were doing. We were rolling around drinking a lot of beer. Um, but it was harmless, I guess, and fun. And then, you know, you'd show up places and, you know, your dressing room would be loaded with the beer. And would be, would would put that away. So. Did you find that like the, cause I found like this, the, the chemicals I'm on while I'm rehearsing are the chemicals I should be on while I'm performing. Did I think that have... that's, uh, I think that, that with, without having ever really thought about it, I think you're right. Yes. Whatever, yeah. whatever they may be. And however it is where, you know, it, it always kind of feels that way. It's like you, you'll do your rehearsal and then you go, okay, I got it. I'm there. This is where exactly where I need to be when I hit the stage for the show and, and sometimes you're there and sometimes you overshoot it and sometimes you, 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 you know, you get that and more, but yeah. And there's also, you know, I don't, you, you know, you tell me what your experience is. There's sometimes where you're going, Oh, I'm, I'm in it right now. I've got it right now. You know? And, and it's, it's a pretty great, it's a euphoric feeling. Am I wrong? That, I think it's the flow state. Yeah. When your brain goes into flow state, it's when the frontal lobe slows down where your ego is like the frontal lobe of I am Dickie, like this is me, me, me. When that thing cools down and stops act becomes less active, you go into this flow state. Yeah. Um, there's a scientist that talks a lot about it. And that's like athletes will get into that. They run faster. This time seems to slow down almost like they can catch up to things. The ball. Right. I love that space. I love that too. And, and uh I would never even heard the expression flow state and I feel so stupid. Um, but I'm going to look it up and look into it because when that hits you and you're on stage, there's nothing like it. I, I can remember clearly it hitting me and, and, you know, turning to the guys and like, going, Oh my gosh, are you here right now? You know, having no, you know, hadn't altered myself in any substantial way, or it was just, it's just coming from, you know, this is the music I've created. These are the people that really love the music that I've created. I'm here right now, and we're we're dialed in. You know, this is but like, like I'm, that yeah. I'm thinking about time and how it's not. I think I talked about this on IRL when you were there, and you're like, "What in the fuck are you talking?" Like, <laughs> time is um, it's a concept that humans built to to better understand mo movement. Because like the earth is turning, we're going, we're turning around the sun. That's all it is. And then they're like, hey, every time we go around the sun once, let's call that an increment of this thing called time. It'll be yeah. a day. But in reality, we're just moving. So when things start to slow down in your brain, it's like the movement, the perception of movement and time starts to change. I think and your description of, of the, the guy going for the past and time starts to slow down. I think that analogy and that, you know, yes, that 
crystallized what I was experiencing or what I experienced at times so perfectly, you know, where it's just, this is, you know, and it's glorious. Yeah. They'll say like when you're having fun, time flies when you're having fun, that, that expression, I've yeah. always found that to be true as well. Maybe it's a form of flow state. Where like right. there is no time, but all of a sudden an hour has gone by, sort of thing. Okay. Will you do me a favor? And the scientist you were talking about, we send me if you come if you think of who it is. I'd, I'd like to, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna write two things down so far that we've been talking about the uh, Jay Giles. Blow your face out. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, let me get this. Three things. <clears throat> blow your face out, and then there's Ozzy's throat thing. Yes. It's, it, it's called a. I just. I, yeah, I will send you an exact picture of that. Okay, thanks. I will look it up and send it. Do, it's great. It could be a placebo. It could be just, you know, you're using it, and and to me, it was like, well, Ozzy told you know, this is, you know. Yeah, speaking of placebo, scientists are like, yo, placebo effect, well, from what I've heard, is like thirty percent effective, and we don't know why. But it right. seems to be there's the nocebo where if you think you have an illness, it'll actually your body will get ill. There's like documented evidence of people being di diagnosed with an illness. Then they end up dying three months later and then they do the autopsy and they didn't actually have the illness. But they just thought, you know, you can shut your own body. Well, down. That's it. It's, it you know, the power of the mind and the power of who, who we are. And, you know, I mean, I don't have to be you to as intelligent as you are to, to know that, the, you know, we're powerful. So if you think this, then, you know, 30% sounds like a low estimate, you know? I think there's people that have lived through stuff and, and you know, just in the strength of what they believe. And I think that there are people that have given up and that had there was no reason why they should, you know, have been as unhealthy or as, as you know, as as they were. But yeah. it's just, you know, it's one of the scary things about the medical industry when someone you respect tells you something and it's like, I, I think I believe it because I respect that person's either authority, their credentials. But uh, knowing that, like a doctor might tell you you've got. But like, do you ever use that power for good as, with your fame and prowess on stage and your fans? Would you tell them like you're healthy? Um, No, I, 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 I what I do is, that, you know, I it's. I try to be positive. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a positive thing. The, the music I, you know, it's not, I've never delivered, I would never deliver, you know, this is it. Um, you know, we're on borrowed time, everybody. It's um, no, as long as we're here and as long as we're together and, you know, and we could see the power, feel the power of the music. Um, I think that uh, that's sort of what, I try to try to preach. So, hey, were you on a? Did you talk with Doctor Drew? Yeah, a couple uh, last week, last Friday. How was that? So good. I love yeah. that man. I like him too a lot. I've been friends with him kind of for a long time. Oh, that's awesome. We should do yeah. something, dude. That's what were you thinking? I used to do his love line early on. Oh, were you guys a team? Do you? No, 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 no. I I would just show up as a guest. <laughs> Oh, I used to watch Love. I listened to that when I in like '93. I'd lay in bed as a young teenager and just like learn about get an STD test. And yeah. Then, and if that that they like people call and they'd be like, my boyfriend wants to sleep with horses, but I still love him. And they'd be like, break up with them. It's the wrong. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> That'd be Adam Carolla would be saying that. He'd be like, it's they both yeah, be like. Here's yeah. what you gotta do. Uh, first of all, break up with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'll say about one of the cool things about doing your best in public and just aggressively being your best is that you end up meeting people through your life that you respected when you were young. I and think you're right. I really think you're right. I think that, um, yeah, I think that there's so much to be said for, for being positive. Um, and then that's, I'm sure that sounds corny too, but I apologize. Well, it is. It's probably it's probably as simple as that and could be a 20 hour conversation about what that means to be positive. Yes, it's a 20 hour conversation that I'm not, I don't want to have. No, not today. Not in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> um, 
but like I I've noticed that like I would Drew you your work with uh the I mean just I listened to let's face it a hundred times in my sophomore year of college like that was like my first long term girlfriend the hottest girl in college you went like, out with the hottest girl in college the hottest girl in the theater department yeah yeah and I was this nerdy kid. And like you guys were all wearing suits. I mean, I listened to a lot of music. Cake, cake was a big part of it, right? Uh, and uh, just because of my ability as an actor, she took interest in me. And right. I was like, I'm not a loser. I actually, if I do what I'm good at aggressively, I can get friends. And then the people started to like me, and I, for the first time, felt like popular in life. So, so give me a quick Ian journey. So you, you're in high school, and you decided you liked acting. Yeah, I was about when I was like. 12 or 13 I thought well I mean I want to be a I want to be I want to be influential I want to be rich so I was like I mean, I'll be a neuroscientist because they were like what are you going to be and I was like I'll be a neuroscientist because then I can help the most people and be rich and then I, as years went on a couple years later I was like well or I could be an actor and be super influential and help people with my voice and like tell them good things and kindness and help them that way and also be rich and I was like right. I'll go towards the the acting I just I felt drawn to it and I got into community co uh theater like around age 15 right dude i did godspell it was my third play i did uh, -huh. uh aladdin and then we did uh 12th night shakespeare and then we did godspell and that was when i met the girl that gave me the mixtape with someday i suppose on it right she when was I, in godspell yeah she was in godspell with me and yeah we we started dating for a while and it was like this girl is just blowing my world man she's amazing and the was music, this a high school production of godspell or or what no, our high school didn't have a theater. We didn't have theater in high school, which was really disappointing. So it was community yeah. with Antic in uh, Cuyahoga Falls, Antic Theater. Yeah. And I did that. And then my before that started, my dad was like, so what are you going to be when you grow up, Ian? He was like 14. I was like, I'm going to be an actor. He's like, then you better start acting. And I was like, okay, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So then I got into the what acting. What did your dad do? He's a fireman. Oh, was, yeah? Yeah, he was career? also like, what's it, a career fireman? Yeah, he, is that what you said, career? Yes. Yeah. He did fireman for like 40 years and uh, or 30 years. And then he did, he was a paramedic as well. In the, oh, interesting. And he was also an orthopedic technician. So he had two jobs. He'd be gone for two days and then he'd be home for 24 hours. And then he'd go 24 hours at the fire department, 10 hours at the hospital. And then he'd be home for 24 hours, which is kind of nice. Cause I got used to him not being around, but also seeing him a lot. It was like a good learning lesson. Is he still with us? Yeah. They're, how's his how's his head from being a paramedic? Up, uh, pretty good. He he would always say, "Be safe." When when I'd leave yeah. the house, he'd be like, "Take, be careful." I'd be like, "Yeah, okay, thanks, okay." In the beginning, I was just kind of annoyed, but then I realized over the years, like, "Thank you." That that's actually a very nice thing to say to someone when they're going outside because the world is not like it might seem like all pretty rainbows, but the world is actually can, can be very dangerous. And so to to have your father telling you, "Be careful," that's like. But I'm also sometimes I find him maybe overly cautious as a result. I've had to kind of get rid of that. Yeah, but weird... he showed he sh he was showing up on the highway and seeing some pretty horrific stuff. Yeah, dude, he told me this one that he went to this one and the guy was like twisted. Part of his body was coming out of a tree. I just asked him about that a couple of years ago. The like, stuff oh. that we drive by and like go, oh, I wonder what's going on over there. Like he's got his face right in it. Yeah. <laughs> my uncle was a paramedic too for for my uncle and my namesake, my uncle Dick in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And he was the chief of the whole police department in Providence, Rhode Island, growing up in the seventies and into the early eighties. And um, the thing about paramedics, and I've told this story recently, and I don't know where I've told it, but there was, um, maybe even to you, maybe we had a conversation. Um, there was a TV show on in the early seventies called Emergency. And it was like one Adam 12. It was like a, you know, LA emergency team. And it was, um, they were a paramedics unit, just, you know, but it was the, you know, there weren't really paramedics units in every city, but because of that TV show, a lot of cities developed their paramedics team. So that's around the time that paramedics became sort of a thing was because of that TV show. And, um, and that's what happened to my uncle. And, and when in Providence, they said, you know, he was just a firefighter. And they're like, all right, we're going to have a paramedics team. Who wants to be part of that? The sort of volunteer thing. And he, was, and he took the job and then ended up being the chief of the entire, you know, 
um, Providence Fire Department. So he'd be on the news when I was a kid. You know, we we're at the scene of some sort of accident. And we're talking now with, you know, chief of the, of the fire department, you know, Dick Barrett. So it's interesting that your dad was the, did the same thing. Yeah, he was from, we were from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, outside of Akron. So it was a <laughs> kind yeah. of a small town. So there wasn't as much like big building fires. He didn't go into the huge high rise stuff Um, and like backdraft that movie. He's like, that wasn't real. They wouldn't go into a building like that. They just hit it from the outside until it either fell down or the fire was out. Yeah. Uh, but, and then, so I don't think he ran on a lot of horror. Did your uncle see like, just, did you ever talk to him about like. He went in his, as an old man, old man, he was a little bit tapioca he, he was you know you could tell it affected him you know it was like a guy that went to war you yeah know? did you go to you must have missed it i mean you didn't go to vietnam or anything. you were too young for that right <laughs> i was way too young for what, vietnam and i didn't go to desert storm what year were you born 60 64 okay so you were like yeah eight you just missed it by like a eight ten years basically yeah yeah was that did it did it traumatize your family Vietnam and that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, no, I mean, you know, but it was like what you, it was. I, I was a kid. So I didn't, you know, did you like, um, I was wondering about your general, like your specific generation, like do dodged, not literally dodged the, the Vietnam, but like was just a little too old for Vietnam and a little too young for desert storm. It's interesting. Ian, cause that's sort of, you know, the, second part of the impression that I get that song it's sort of what it's about is is you know I've never had to knock on wood uh, uh, but I know someone who has it it was about our generation my generation being sort of there was no great depression or you know no Vietnam or no you know we were just kind of cruising through and at the time that I had written that a lot's changed I guess since then but you know, just can you measure up was was sort of the the question I was asking in that song. Yeah, man. Something about evolution that I've read over the years is that people don't do it until they have to. And that it's like if we don't have like the real like if there's not actual starvation on the table that we're not going to get off the centralized power grids, the centralized water grids. Like if there's not like and that concerns me because I, I, I'm afraid that people will. If they don't have trauma, they'll actually create trauma for themselves in order to grow. And that, like, I, don't, I, don't I just I completely understand what you're saying, and you you're right on the money. I think that uh, unless it's you know we're completely faced with it, um, you know it's and that that was what I was asking. Like, hey, do I have you know who you know the people that did go to were in World War II or you know. The sort, the, you know, the epic sort of um, challenges of life that so many generations were faced with. I, I was at the time I wrote that song. I was asking, you know, am am can I would I be able to handle that if I was, you know, forced to or or had to? I I just watched a video of this. Uh, it was like on Morbid Knowledge, the Twitter channel, or some Twitter channel. I'm sorry, you don't have Twitter, do you? I I looked. I didn't see you on Twitter. On X. Me? Yeah. Um, well, I'm I'm there, but very lightly. Okay. But well, I saw this video of this Marine. It was like Marine training. And it's this dude going into a fucking pipe with water. And he's like, got to go lay on his back in the water with his M16 or his rifle. And he's like, slowly, like, you see his face is like, and he's going into this pipe where it's like, there's water filling the pipe up to like the very oh top. God. And he's got, and the water's like going up over his head and down. And it, I, I, I shut the video like, and I'm like, I'm having tr like trouble just watching a video of a guy going through it. <laughs> and they want to send 200 billion to you, these people in the, like what in the, like, are we doing? Yeah. Dude? Oh, the concern I have for humanity right now is, is. Off it's, the charts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know what other than screaming and singing, doing shows like this. And then music, like, I feel a lot of the answer. Maybe I'm not so like so like fantastical that I think Bill and Ted's excellent adventure is legitimate. Like you write some hit songs and save the world. But at the same time, I kind of am like, I think that vibration cymatics can cause shape to change. 
Um, maybe it's just that it's part of the change and you just happen to be the one singing the, the words that were going to come out anyway, but maybe you're actually inciting the change. I don't think you're wrong. I think that there's definitely truth there. I'm, uh, I'm going to pull up a super chat we had earlier that uh, someone wanted to. Uh, this is from Spider Clamp. He said, I always believed the radio was a pay for play industry. How close am I in, in that thinking? Um, I think that certain times, <clears throat> more than others, for sure. I think um, <clears throat> a lot of that went on. And sometimes there's, there's plenty of, of movies and documentation of, of uh, payola and, and people going in. And uh, I think the radio <clears throat> worked an awful lot like the pharmaceutical company works, where your salesman goes in there and says, okay, this is your, uh, this is the songs. Here's your hits. There we go. Now let's go out and get a, you know, let's go to a strip club. Now you know what you're playing, and here's your here's your drugs du jour. This is what we want you to push, and uh, a lot of that went on. So, like the salesman would come in from like BMI, like some music production. Yeah, the radio Central. guys they'd call them, radio yeah. promotion guys, uh -huh. and they would go around and and uh, tell you what the you know what their record company is is uh, promoting or pushing. Man, are are you on tour right now? You're a house, obviously. Yeah. Are you, are you like, when you go now, when you guys play, are you, do you just like fly out to the venue for a night and then fly home? Well, yes, that's what we've been doing. Cause we, we don't have a tour booked yet, but we're, we're in the process of, of finding that tour and booking that tour. Ian, have you listened to the full Defiant album? Yeah. The other, yeah. Oh my God. It's so good. There's like five. I was singing along, dude. I'm doing harmonies <laughs> on a bunch of these. Uh, the, it is over. Oh, oh yeah. Over. I was doing the harmony like Joe goes down over. And I'm like going over. I was doing these upward harmonies along with Joe. Sounds yeah. so good. Yeah. I'm going to go it's meet up with Greg. On it, yeah, dude. The the three-part harmonies are like, I, I don't know if it's John, Joe, and if it's just John and Joe. <laughs> Greg. Or Greg, Greg, all three of them are doing harmonies. It's it's like a very Crosby, Stills, and Nash. It's got that. No. Oh my gosh, that's high praise. Yeah, dude. And I want to come in like Neil Young on top and do some high shit and like uh like sting on top of your dire straits. <clears throat> and just Let's for like a song. That song. Yeah. I'm gonna go to uh uh Tennessee and meet up with Greg and um Pete after the new year. And you just, are yeah, doodle around, we'll see what happens, <clears throat> make some more noise on top of a track. I mean it is over was I think that's the best one on the album. And I was like, there was another name I was going to call. I was like, oh, why isn't it called this? But then I was like, well, if it's the last song on the album, then I can see that it's called It Is Over. And then when you guys say it's over and it just, the album's all over. Yeah. That was like, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for recording it. Um, <laughs> hey, I, I think we should, it's, we've been going for an hour and I kind of think, I think it's time to wrap this, but. I had a question um, more that I just wanted to know the answer to. The rascal that hour thing. flew by. Time Dude, flies when you're having fun, my friend. That's it's. We were flowing. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the rascal king? He's a guy named James Michael Curley. He was a mayor of Boston years and years ago, before I was born. And um, he was a pretty fantastic character. They've they've made uh, they've made movies about him. This movie called The Last Hurrah. That that was and uh, many and many books have been written about him. One of the books was called The Rascal King. Another one was called The Purple Shamrock. And uh, and the one he wrote was called I'd Do It Again. And uh, <clears throat> he was, you know, classic Boston Irish um, politician of its day, and and people either absolutely loved him thought he hung the moon or or said ah didn't like him at all but he was he was a terrific guy i want to uh meet up with you guys when you're on tour and maybe catch you guys one night hang out before or after the show that'd be pretty fun too ian i would love that it's never a bad guys. time to hang out with you my friend that's what I'm talking about, man. I had a great uh, time meeting you, and I enjoyed doing this podcast. Thank you so much. I'm sorry um, that I uh, started it off so awkwardly. 
hey, you know, that's it's going to be memorable. That's that's one of the wonders <laughs> of doing it live. And everyone that's listening, check out the defiantofficial.com. It's uh, where you get Dickie's new album with the band, The Defiant, uh, Pete Parada, Joey is it Ryu. Is that how you say jo or John's last name? Johnny Ryu. Ryu. Johnny Ryu. Ryu. Greg, Greg Camp and uh, Joe, Joe LaRocca. Just yeah. a fantastic group. Yeah. Really amazing guys. I want to have Greg on the show coming up soon, too. He's a beautiful soul. I mean, every, all of them, everybody in the band is so incredible. And it, it was exhilarating to be in the room with you guys rocking that out. Even though the first song, the 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 monitors weren't working and some there were some flat notes I could hear because the, there were no monitors. Do you like sorry, when you I'm sing? Sorry. Hey, well, I mean, what do you sing without mon like can you do it without monitors in general? I prefer or do you to have my monitors right in my ears. And um, I don't know. I don't yeah, I don't I've set the bar about here, and I'm usually able to clear it. So, and after the song, you're like, "Was how was that, guys? Don't lie to me." And they were all like, "It was fine. It was great. It was fine." Like, okay, let's go. Right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dicky Barrett. Uh, follow him on the internet everywhere, man. And follow the Defiant, the DefiantOfficial.com. And uh, for me, and I want to make sure it is the Defiant Official, the DefiantOfficial.com. For this, like the video, share the video with your friends, relatives, loved ones, and everyone. And uh, get the album. Yeah, get the Define Official, get the Defiance album. You get it at the defineofficial.com. And uh, I think there's a link. Yep, there's a link. And you can also buy the vinyl, which is pretty spectacular. Do you have it on vinyl at your house? Uh, no, but um, every time I try to get some, it's uh, Joey, the guy in the band, is the guy who actually sends out all the merch. And, uh, and he's swamped. So me asking him, could you send me some? I always feel bad. I don't yeah. want to give him to work yeah well so, I, i'm i'm looking forward to it i don't have a record player right now but that's still pretty cool i'd like to like get it hanging on my wall or something I think yeah i'm gonna do that today all right man bye my buddy see you Talk later bro yeah dude